Hey guys, Reckl here, and welcome to my continuing analysis of Avatar The Last Airbender. Last time we talked about why book 1 was such a success, but will book 2 be the same? Let's find out as I review Avatar The Last Airbender, book 2. Alright, so just like last time, let's break this down into smaller parts. I want to talk about animation, world building, storytelling, and character development. After saving the Northern Water Tribe from the Fire Nation invasion, Team Avatar sets out to Omashu so Aang can learn how to earthbend from King Bumi. Upon arrival though, he learns that Amashu has unfortunately been taken over by the Fire Nation. They manage to save Bumi, but he tells them, Your teacher will be someone who has mastered neutral jig. You need to find someone who waits and listens before striking. So after escaping Omashu, Team Avatar continues their search for an earthbending teacher for Aang. Eventually, Aang finds a teacher in Toph Beifong, and she joins the team. All the while they're being chased by Azula and her friends. Together, the team discovers a secret way to defeat the Fire Nation, but Appa gets kidnapped. They head over to the city of Ba Sing Se to search for him and to inform the Earth King of the Fire Nation's weakness. Zuko and Ira also end up in Ba Sing Se and go on their own adventures. From here on out, the rest of the season focuses on character development, conspiracies, and insane amounts of storytelling. Holy smokes! And that's pretty much the story of Book 2 in a nutshell. Just like Book 1, the story is solid and has enough going for it to draw you in. The animation for Book 2 of Avatar was done by South Korean studio's JM Animation, and a new studio was added called Muay Animation. Again, everything is spot on with tons of action sequences and lots of beautiful bending scenes. Check it out! So let's jump into Book 2's world building. Now, you would think that you've pretty much seen everything that the world of Avatar has to offer in Book 1, right? Well, you'd be surprised. Book 2 still shows us the unique ways that earthbenders use their bending abilities, however, it also introduces us to two different variants of earthbending. This comes in the form of sand bending and Toph's discovery of metal bending. We're also introduced to another form of water bending known as swamp bending. Even Uncle Iroh and Azula introduce us to the concept of another version of fire bending in the form of lightning bending. These variants of bending are important because they show the adaptability of humans in the world of Avatar, and they can't be performed by everyone. For example, Swamp benders migrated from the Southern Water Tribe thousands of years ago and settled in the foggy swamp in the Earth Kingdom. Here, they learned swamp bending, where a waterbender can manipulate the water inside of plants to control them. Earthbenders found themselves in the desert and adapted their bending to manipulate sand to travel through the dunes. Toph, while locked inside a metal box, sensed the earthly materials inside of the metal and was able to bend them. Iroh explains to Zuko about how to bend lightning, and when Zuko can't learn it, Iroh teaches his nephew how to redirect lightning through his body instead. These are all great ways to think outside of the box and to use their bending differently. Mind you, this is book 2, and they're already pulling out the stops with all these new concepts. Now a good chunk of book 2 takes place in the city of Ba Sing Se. What's great about these parts is the amount of time they spend introducing us to the cultures and lifestyles of living in this grand city. At the start, we see that the city has its own train system run by earthbenders. This is very unique to Ba Sing Se, as we never see it in any other city. The other thing to admire is the city's architecture. Ba Sing Se is designed with rings that form walls separating the different social classes. The closer you are to the inner circle of the city, the higher you are on the social ladder. The outside ring represents the very poor, and this is where refugees are bought. It's pretty lawless and dangerous. It's also interesting to note that it is possible to move up the social ladder from one of the outer rings into one of the inner ones. This is seen when Zuko and Iroh start off in Ba Sing Se as refugees in the outer ring. When Iroh accepts an offer to open up his own tea shop, it takes them into an inner ring of the city. It's interesting to see how the society of this city is very different from what we've seen in the past. When Team Avatar arrives at Ba Sing Se, we're given a tour and introduced to Judy, a personal guide. It's fascinating because Judy's role is to convince visitors that everything is okay in Ba Sing Se. And even though the heroes try to reach out to others about the Fire Nation War or other occurrences, we constantly see her trying to stop them to the point where she says, You're in Ba Sing Se now. Everyone is safe here. It's eventually revealed that the king is a puppet and the entire city is being run by his advisor, Long Feng. In order to keep the peace, Long Feng believes that the people of the city must be completely ignorant to the happenings of the outside world. So when someone steps out of line or threatens this peace, the daily agents who work under him are sent after them. And in the case of Jet, they become brainwashed so that the threat can be neutralized. This conspiracy arc is great, and it shows us how a city can be ignorant to the outside world by their officials concealing the truth. It gets really dark, 
especially when the team discovers the Daili's underground headquarters. Here, we see several people trained to be Judies. During the confrontation with Fei Long, Jack gets killed. Mind you, a kid gets killed by a grown man. It just goes to show how far the government of Ba Sing Se is willing to go to keep their secrets. Overall, it's pretty brutal, but nonetheless, all of this makes for epic world building, and it really sets the scene for what the heroes have to overcome. Another returning feature is the spirit world. Now, while it's never fully explained as to how bending occurs, we do get some really interesting explanations about the Avatar state from Avatar Roku and Guru Patik. From Avatar Roku, we learn about the immense power of the Avatar state, but also the vulnerability that comes with it. One thing is made perfectly clear. If Aang gets killed while in the Avatar state, the reincarnation cycle will be broken and the Avatar will cease to exist. During his meeting with Guru Patik, Aang learns about the seven chakras and how to unlock them. Doing this will give him the ability to enter the Avatar state at will. These rules on how the Avatar state work are great and adds weaknesses to an otherwise broken ability for Aang throughout the show. This is all fascinating to watch as an adult, and yet again, these types of topics are definitely not something I'd expect to see in a children's show, but here they are. Next we're going to talk about storytelling. <sighs> if when you clicked on this video you were wondering why it was so long, this topic is the reason. Get ready though, because this is going to go in a bunch of different directions. I probably should have just made separate videos for all these topics, but they're all relevant to book 2's epic storytelling, so let's get started. First I want to talk about the topic of urgency. In Book 1, we learn from Avatar Roku that Aang must defeat Ozai before Sozin's Comet returns, or the Fire Nation will be too powerful to stop. This roughly gives Aang one year to master the four elements. This type of mechanic adds urgency to the story and lets the audience know about how long this adventure is going to be. If that isn't bad enough, after exploring Washi Tung's library, Team Avatar discovers that the Fire Nation will lose their firebending abilities during the next solar eclipse. So this adds even more urgency into Aang mastering the elements so that he can defeat Ozai even sooner. That's a lot of pressure for a 12 year old kid. This type of mechanic has been used for years and can be very successful for storytelling when done right. Remember in the original Star Wars movie when the Resistance had to stop the Death Star from getting into range of destroying the Rebel base? That's another example of urgency. It puts the characters into a high risk, high loss situation with a certain time constraint and gets the audience excited to see the results. Adding urgency to a story usually prevents it from being stale as the characters are expected to do a specific task before it's too late. This mechanic in Avatar certainly keeps the audience engaged and also makes them wonder, how is Aang going to pull all this off before the eclipse? And the only way to find out is to keep watching. Okay, now there's no doubt that Avatar has some really cool characters in it, but did you notice that Book 2 also has a massive amount of diversity? Now, back in the day, many moons ago, when I was a wee lad, female characters in cartoons came in two basic flavors. They were either the love interest, or they'd be the plot device damsel in distress. And sometimes they were both. And this wasn't just limited to cartoons. This went on to be the reason we played video games or even watched movies. There's something dreadfully romantic about the hero fighting for his love interest, or saving a princess, and the entertainment industry made big bank off of these stories in the 80s and 90s. But then something happened. As people began to grow, they realized females didn't have to be limited to these roles. Though scarce at the time, we started to see stronger female characters, and we're slowly ditching those older stereotypes altogether. So what am I trying to say? In many popular stories, there might only be two female characters, and they fall into the roles I just mentioned. This sucks, because females are rarely represented without some type of sexual context in media. But then comes along Avatar The Last Airbender. Make way, folks, because you're getting not one, not two, but a total of six female characters. If you don't count Avatar Kiyoshi. Now this is a big deal because each of these characters doesn't fall into the two roles I mentioned, and they are their own individuals. Let me explain. Katara, though the love interest in the story for Aang, never really falls into the role because that's not the main interest in the show. She proves she's a powerful waterbender on her own and doesn't require the constant aid of a man to be relevant to the story. She's independent. In fact, it's her quick thinking that causes her to save Aang instead, which is a complete role reversal in the industry. Toph, though blind, also doesn't need anybody's help and is beyond independent. She's rough around the edges, and beneath that hard exterior are a few soft spots, but her abilities in the story make her out to be one of the most broken characters in the show. Azula is an aggressive leader that's very goal-oriented. She's also incredibly powerful and intimidating and knows how to get what she wants. Tsai Li is bubbly and friendly, and you might think that makes her soft, but as a non-bender, she is one of the best fighters in the show. 
In fact, she manages to beat Sokka and Katara with nothing more than her hands. Suki is the leader of the Kyoshi Warriors, a group of non-bending warrior women, and while she becomes a love interest for Sokka, she's a better fighter than he is and can hold her own in battle. Mei is the emo one in the group, and also a non-bender. She's also the love interest of Zuko, but again, that's not important compared to her ability to fight against Team Avatar. Each of these characters are important to the overall story and have different goals and personalities. I'd like to point out that I've never heard anybody say Avatar has too many female characters in it. You know why? Because each of these young women are not only relatable, but the writing involved also makes them believable. Another show that does this well is My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. This show introduces the audience to six different characters, each being an extreme of one archetype or another, but it's usually consistent and viewers will be able to relate to at least one of the characters. These two shows did an excellent job of representing different types of women. It's important to remember that regardless of what gender your characters are in a story, they need to be well written and believable. Book 2 continues its writing from season 1 with these great female characters. Okay, now we're going to talk about what makes Book 2 so amazing from a story perspective. And to get that answer, we're going to compare it to Star Wars as they both have several things in common. I believe it was Ryan Johnson who coined the term subverting expectations, and that's exactly what happens here. For those who don't know, subverting expectations is when you take what you think the audience is expecting and you do the complete opposite. Sometimes this works out great, and other times it's a terrible decision. To see a great example, we're going to take a look at Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back. After their heroic victory from A New Hope, the heroes continue their war against the evil empire, but something's completely different about this film. Most of the expectations are subverted. It's surprising when Lando betrays the heroes. It's surprising when Han gets frozen in carbonite. It's surprising that Darth Vader is Luke's father. These events continue when Luke gets his hand chopped off and plummets to his death, yet manages to survive. And at the end of the film, the heroes are completely defeated. It's a rather depressing ending for the movie, but secretly, it's actually a great ending. Now the reason I say this is because the film keeps you guessing what's going to happen until the very end. The way episode 5 ends is on a cliffhanger, but there are so many questions left unanswered that the audience will want to come back and see the next film. And that's great! In a way, the books of Avatar are similar to the films of the original Star Wars trilogy. There's victory and hope at the conclusion of the first respective book and movie, and then there's absolute chaos at the end of the second ones. So let's break down the subverted expectations in Avatar. We spend an entire season with Zuko, evading capture from the Fire Nation, and building a new life in Ba Sing Se. He gets sick when trying to reform his life and comes out of it a better person. We even see him adjusting to his new life as he goes out on a date with a girl. Zuko struggles with the internal conflicts of his past, but he frees Appa and gives up being the blue spirit, thus symbolically showing that he's changed as a person. He has this moment with Katara underground and you start thinking, Oh man, this is it. He's about to be one of the good guys. Even Uncle Iroh believes it. But then, bam, old habits die hard and Zuko betrays his uncle for a shot at getting his honor back by capturing the Avatar. Even Katara is shocked. I thought you would change! This was very surprising for me the first time I saw it. We spent so much time watching Zuko transform, only to revert back. This is very real and believable. Turns out that Zuko's temptation of earning his abusive father's respect is greater than Iroh's teachings. I want the Avatar. I want my honor. My throne. I want my father not to think I'm worthless. But this was highly unexpected. Now remember when in Empire Strikes Back, Luke has a vision of his friends getting messed up and he leaves Yoda's training session? And Yoda's like, don't do it, you're gonna die. Yeah, same thing in Book 2 of Avatar. Hang has a vision of Katara in danger and abandons Guru Patik's training before he can unlock the final chakra. Leaving their teachers to help their friends leads to both heroes getting terribly messed up. Luke has his hand chopped off by Vader and Aang gets zapped by Azula. Again, this was totally unexpected. I thought Aang was gonna hit the Avatar state and whoop butt, but instead we get this. And this is terrifying because it's unexpected, and to make matters worse, that's the end of the season. Aang is barely alive and the heroes retreat while Azula takes over Ba Sing Se. Terrible ending for a season? Mm, maybe. But that cliffhanger though. So now you gotta come back. You gotta see how book 3 ends because there's all these unanswered questions, right? Does Zuko get his honor restored? What becomes of Uncle Iroh? Will the Fire Nation win the war? Will Aang recover? Will he ever hit the Avatar state again? Will Aang fight the Fire Lord? And will Katara and Aang ever end up together? The same exists for Empire Strikes Back. But remember, the desire to see the ending of a trilogy is only there if the writing is good in the first two parts. Whew. Okay, now character development. In Book 1 of Avatar, we got introduced to the main cast and they each had their own little arcs, but the great thing about Book 2 is that some of these characters continue to build off their original arcs while others develop new arcs altogether. Again, 
This is great writing as people do go through several changes in their lives. Also, as a side note, this section is going to echo and refer to many of the same events, mainly because a lot of the character development stories are intertwined with other characters. So let's jump into it. Okay, now in the last video I mentioned how Sokka's arc was about him changing his views about being a misogynist. But Sokka had another arc in book 1. I just didn't mention it because it really starts to build up in book 2, and that arc comes in the form of being a man. So let's do some backtracking. In book 1 we see Sokka trying to be a great warrior and a leader, and this is because Sokka has a great deal of love and respect for his father Hakoda. We even see a flashback of him wanting to go to war with his dad, but his dad tells him to stay behind. It's a heart-wrenching moment, but it's something that stays with Sokka. The concept of being a man for him is important. Very much like Zuko, there is a great feeling of accomplishment making their fathers proud of them. As the story progresses, we begin to see Sokka make educated decisions. This first happens in the episode with Jet. Sokka realizes that Jet is an extremist when he tries to kick an innocent old man in the face and stops him. Sokka realizes though the old man was from the Fire Nation, there are innocents in this war. Sokka understands that Jet is a corrupt leader and warns Katara and Aang about it. When they don't believe him, he sets out to do the right thing on his own. It's because of this that he manages to save the people of a Fire Nation village from being wiped out in a flood. Because his father's at war, Hakoda's friend Batu guides Sokka in a water tribe sailing ritual. This ritual is important to Sokka's culture, but also a sign of being an adult. After finishing it, he feels closer to his father. For Sokka, the mark of the wise. The same mark your father earned. In the same episode, Sokka is the one who discovers that Jun's creature sees using smell, and comes up with the idea to confuse it using the perfume in the abbey. This decision ends up saving the day as the creature goes berserk and starts attacking Zuko and Jun. Near the end of book 1, Sokka gives advice to the Northern Water Tribe about the Fire Nation and proves to be knowledgeable. Because of this, he's left to protect Yue because the chief trusts him more than Yue's actual fiancé. This speaks volumes to his character, and Sokka slowly rises up to be the man that he wants to be. In book 2, we begin to see Sokka use more logic and slowly become more of a strategist. When they arrive at Washington's library, it's Sokka who decides to figure out when the next solar eclipse will arrive. This information is critical to defeat the Fire Nation. When the Fire Nation attacks the outer walls of Ba Sing Se with a massive drill, it's Sokka that tells the others they have to destroy it from the inside. Because of their teamwork, they're able to stop the drill, and Sokka slowly establishes himself as the strategist for their team. Why are you all looking at me? You're the idea guy. So I'm the only one who can ever come up with a plan? That's a lot of pressure. And also the complaining guy. That part I don't mind. Sokka's arc reaches its climax near the end of the season when he reunites with his dad. What should I do, dad? Aren't you listening? I said the rest of you men get ready for battle. You don't know how much this means to me, dad. I'll make you proud. And I'll finally prove to you what a great warrior I am. Sokka, you don't have to prove anything to me. I'm already proud of you. And I've always known you're a great warrior. Really? Why do you think I trusted you to look after our tribe when I left? It's all of these moments that change Sokka from being an arrogant comic relief character to a valued and important member of the team. Mind you, Sokka is a non-bender and physically the weakest character of the team, yet his contributions are extremely important. That doesn't mean that all of his decisions are good ones, but he's still got a lot to learn. In book 1, Katara's goal was to learn water bending from a teacher, and by the end of the season, she became a master. With that in mind, Katara's role in book 2 changes drastically. She really doesn't go through a massive arc, and that's perfectly okay because there are more characters added to the story. Her motherly instincts show up when she tells Zuko she can help heal Iroh after he gets zapped by Azula, and again when she hints that she can remove Zuko's scar with her spiritual water. Now, some people think these encounters mean that Zuko and Katara have a thing for each other. Let me just say this. I don't buy it. Katara has such a big heart and is so empathetic that she's even willing to help the enemy if she can relate to them. Something I forgot to mention in my review of book 1 about Katara is the romantic relationship slowly forming between her and Aang. And while it's not the main point of the story, there are hints of it spread throughout books 1 and 2. These sprinklings are there to remind you that this subplot is still relevant. In book 2, Aang goes into the Avatar state after believing Katara has been killed. They share a special moment in the cave of two lovers, and Aang eventually tells Katara he likes her. Seeing this family together, so full of happiness and love, it's reminded me how I feel about Appa, and how I feel about you. The 
this subplot ultimately takes its final form when Katara ends up saving Aang after he gets zapped by Azula. The love subplot is alive and kicking. Make no mistake, this is again a subplot, but there are plenty of scenes of Katara being an important character and not simply a love interest. In book 1, Aang's main goal was to find a master to teach him waterbending. His arc led him to forgiving himself for his past and moving on to be the avatar that the world needs. However, things get really wild in book 2 and there's several things going on for Aang. So let's break this down into even more parts. First off, book 2 has Aang looking for a master to teach him how to do earthbending and he finds one in the character of Toph Beifong. Now while there's no doubt that Toph is beyond qualified for the job, she's very aggressive and rough when it comes to teaching Aang. It also doesn't help that it's naturally harder for Aang to learn how to earthbend due to earth being the opposite element of air. After several setbacks, Aang eventually stands his ground and learns how to earthbend, and it plays a massive part for the remainder of Book 2, especially when the team decides to invade the Earth Kingdom Palace. This is easily one of the best animated segments in Book 2, and it's incredible to watch. It's Toph's influence over Aang that not only makes him a better bender overall, but teaches him how to be a bit more aggressive for the things that he wants. Now the second arc for Aang in Book 2 comes in the relationship he has with Katara and the Avatar State. Early on, we see an Earth General try to force Aang into the Avatar State by threatening him and pretending to kill Katara. It doesn't go too well, and in his rage, Aang enters the Avatar State and it's a total mess. I don't care what anybody says, some of these people, they died. This happened because of his fear of losing Katara. Later on in the desert, Appa gets kidnapped and Aang gets angry again. In their search for Appa, Momo gets taken by a buzzard wasp. Aang manages to save Momo, but in a rage of pent-up anger, makes sure that the creature never comes back. <laughs> so straight up, Aang uses his airbending to murder this bug. Look at this. That thing is clearly cut in two, and then Aang just walks off like he's some kind of anti-hero. This side of Aang is fairly new to the show because up to this book, we really didn't get to see Aang get angry. We've seen sadness and grief, but not straight up anger. It's this anger that reaches its peak when the team eventually finds Appa's kidnappers and Aang learns that they placed a muzzle on Appa. You muzzled Appa? This is when Aang goes mental. He goes into full avatar mode and is about to destroy these people when Katara stops him. I love the face she gives him. It's like, here we go again. Eventually, Aang calms down and that's the end of the episode. It's great to see a character care so much about his friends that it almost blinds him. This is important to Aang's arc. After having lost all of the air nomads, Aang's not taking any more chances. So when Aang is in trouble, he's okay with it. But once his friends are in danger, it's personal and things get serious. Eventually the team finds Appa and they're reunited. But attached to Appa's horn is a note from Guru Patik. Aang goes to meet the Guru and teaches Aang about the seven chakras with the promise that if he is able to open all of them, he will be able to control the Avatar state at will. These scenes are intense as they show all of the fear, guilt, shame, grief, lies, illusions, and attachments Aang has in the world. During the training, Aang has a vision of Katara in danger and ends up choosing to go rescue her instead of finishing the training. This decision has consequences though. Aang can no longer enter into the Avatar state for choosing an earthly attachment. Now this is where it gets tricky. Throughout the series, we're shown scenes where it looks like there's a romance starting between Aang and Katara but all of a sudden, he has to make the painful choice of detaching himself from her. That's a pretty intense thing to expect from someone, and Aang's not happy about it. Why would I let go of Katara? I... I love her! During the rescue, Aang finds himself outnumbered. He realizes he needs the Avatar State to win and detaches Katara from his life, but Azula takes advantage of the time it took him to enter the Avatar State and zaps him in the back. Iroh stalls for time so they can escape, and that's pretty much the end of book two. It ends in tragedy, and that's amazing! So in the end, Aang's arc takes him on a journey to learn earthbending, but also to have a greater understanding of the Avatar state. He admits his true feelings for Katara, but then struggles to detach himself from her in order to control the Avatar state at will. As I mentioned before, this book's ending is great in that it makes the viewers want to come back and see how it all ends. Aang's journey still has a while to go, but we'll have to wait to see how it all pans out in book 3. Just like Aang, Zuko's arc is a tough one to cover because it's all about growth and self-discovery. There's a bunch of things to discuss, so let's jump into it. In the beginning of Book 2, Zuko and Iroh are labeled as traitors and are on the run from the Fire Nation. This takes them on several adventures, and they end up traveling throughout the Earth Kingdom. To survive, Zuko does some underhanded things, including stealing and even donning the Mask of the Blue Spirit once again. Iroh doesn't approve of these methods, and Zuko eventually goes out on his own. In the episode appropriately labeled, Zuko Alone, we see one of these adventures as Zuko gets help from some Earth Kingdom farmers. Even though they don't have much, they are willing to help out Zuko as much as they can and their kid takes a liking to him. The town is attacked by other Earth Kingdom thugs and Zuko decides to protect the village. 
He manages to save them, but reveals his identity as Prince of the Fire Nation. Man, the second the villagers learn of this, they all grow to hate Zuko, including the kid that once liked him. The episode ends with Zuko having to leave the village, but he learns a very valuable lesson from all of this. People generally hate the Fire Nation. Despite his good intentions and heroics, they cannot see past the fact that he was the Fire Nation Prince. It was definitely a hard blow for Zuko, but one that opened his eyes to how others view the Fire Nation. Experiencing this is important for him to ultimately decide what he wants to do with his life. Eventually, Zuko and Iroh reunite only to run into the Avatar and learn that Azula is also trying to catch him. This leads to an epic showdown in an abandoned town where Azula takes on Team Avatar, Zuko, and Iroh on her own. Azula gets cornered and zaps Iroh. In the confusion, she manages to escape. Now this is important. Up to this point, we mostly see Zuko only care for capturing the Avatar, but this is the first time we see him care for another person. He's devastated by Iroh getting hurt, and it's great to see this emotion from him. Iroh realizes that Azula is crazy and decides to teach Zuko how to lightning bend, but Zuko is unable to. Iroh begins to teach him about how each nation works. This conversation with Zuko is important because it's another instance where Zuko is learning the importance of balance in the world among benders. Iroh also explains that learning about the other cultures will make him whole. Man, <laughs> this is some crazy philosophy for a children's show, huh? Iroh then teaches Zuko the movements needed to redirect lightning. However, he refuses to zap Zuko to test it because it's too dangerous. So what does Zuko do? <laughs> he goes out into a thunderstorm with the hopes that lightning will strike him so he can redirect it. This kid is determined. The dialogue Zuko uses is intense. It's a powerful scene and he breaks down. You just see this guy and realize, man, he's just had such a bad life. And the episode ends right there. Beautiful. Eventually, Iroh and Zuko make it to Ba Sing Se and start new lives as tea shop workers. Zuko even gets to go on a date and it's terribly awkward but brilliant at the same time. Zuko continues living this boring life until he learns that Appa is in Ba Sing Se. Zuko eventually finds the Sky Bison, but Iroh shows up as well and they have a tough conversation about destiny and how Zuko needs to make his own choices. I know my own destiny, uncle. Is it your own destiny? Or is it a destiny someone else has tried to force on you? Stop it, uncle. I have to do this. I'm begging you, Prince Zuko. It's time for you to look inward and begin asking yourself the big questions. Who are you? And what do you want? The entire thing eats him up inside and Zuko snaps. He ends up freeing Appa and gives up being the blue spirit. All these experiences and lessons eventually start to affect Zuko, and it causes a severe inner conflict in him to the point where he gets sick. Iroh nurses Zuko back to health, and when he awakes, he is reborn. And for a brief time, Zuko is happy. It really seems like he's going to change things for the better, until Azula talks him into helping her capture the Avatar to restore his honor. Zuko tosses everything he's worked for to decide and betrays his uncle for one last shot, that last glimmer of hope of having things return to the way they used to be. In the end, Aang is believed to be dead, and at the end of the book, the Fire Nation captures Ba Sing Se, and Zuko is welcomed back to the Fire Nation, all at the cost of betraying Uncle Iroh. The struggles that Zuko goes through are complicated and full of conflicting emotions based on trying to please his father, despite knowing his actions were wrong. Traveling through the Earth Kingdom has taught Zuko many lessons about morality, but also about making his own decisions. His arc is an interesting rise and fall of character, but it's shrouded in abusive complexity and improper understanding of what he wants for himself. An enormous part of Zuko's arc focuses on the word destiny. This season ends in a bit of mystery for Zuko, as viewers will have to wait until book 3 to see what Zuko's regrets and rewards are for his actions. Alright, so Toph is an interesting one. She comes from a very wealthy family, however, because she is blind, her parents are very overprotective of her. They feel she's too fragile and could get hurt easily. My daughter is blind. She is blind and tiny and helpless and fragile. She cannot help you. If they only knew. Because of bending, Toph can kind of see, and it's because of this and her aggressive nature that she was the champion of a wrestling-like earthbending competition. When she learns that teaching the Avatar earthbending could get her to escape her family, she runs away and joins the team. It's immediately obvious that Toph is a rough fit for the team because she's obnoxious, selfish, and the polar opposite of Katara. Being blind made her parents overprotective, and even after she expresses her feelings to them, they just want to protect her more. I've let you have far too much freedom. From now on, you will be cared for and guarded 24 hours a day. She's not a fan of authority figures or being told what to do, which happens to be Katara's specialty. 
Despite being blind, Toph is completely self-sufficient and focuses on herself. She even mentioned she's never had friends before. But I'm 12 years old and I've never had a real friend. She doesn't know how to be part of a team, and eventually she gets fed up and leaves the group. It's during this time that she runs into Uncle Iroh, and he gives her some advice. Moved by Iroh's words, Toph rejoins the team. She teaches Aang how to earthbend using tough love. It's Iroh's words of wisdom that melts Toph's rough exterior, and while she's still rough around the edges, Toph finally gets the freedom she's always wanted, and perhaps even more important, she learns about friendship. Also, something I just wanted to throw out there while we're talking about Toph. Remember in book one when Aang was fighting King Boomy and he said, You thought I was a frail old man, but I'm the most powerful earthbender you'll ever see. Well, turns out King Boomy lied because Toph is actually the world's greatest earthbender. Remember when you were a kid and you were kind of good at something and you said you were the best at it? Well, after watching Toph's earthbending, you start to realize, you know, maybe she was telling the truth. But in all seriousness, Toph's bending is ridiculous, especially after she discovers metal bending. She's the greatest earthbender I've ever seen. Her abilities are on full display when Team Avatar rushes into the Earth Kingdom Palace. The animation here is top notch, and this is when we get to see some of the broken bending that Toph is capable of. Without a shadow of a doubt, Toph is a highly valued member of Team Avatar, and definitely the world's greatest earthbender. I am the greatest earthbender in the world! Don't you two dunderheads ever forget it! In book one, I didn't do much talking about Iroh, because there wasn't much of an arc for him, but man do things get intense for him in book two. You see, Iroh's story is one about loss and regret. We learned in book one that Iroh was once a great war general for the Fire Nation, and he retired after he lost his son at the Battle of Ba Sing Se. Since then, Iroh sees Zuko as his surrogate son. This is why he's constantly trying to offer advice and words of wisdom. After book one, Iroh and Zuko are labeled traitors to the Fire Nation and go into hiding. At one point, Zuko gives up hope, but Iroh says, No, Zuko. You must never give in to despair. Allow yourself to slip down that road, and you surrender to your lowest instincts. In the darkest times, hope is something you give yourself. That is the meaning of inner strength. This is a big thing to say from a former great general who lost his own son. You see, the great thing about Iroh is that despite losing the most important thing in his life, he still didn't give up on hope. Whereas most in his position would have become jaded, Iroh instead becomes a cheerful, enlightened individual. I'm thankful because you decided to share this special day with me. It means more than you know. He's spiritual and offers advice to anyone that's willing to listen to it. This is shown when he offers advice to Toph and eventually Aang. But the real highlight about all of this comes in the episode of Tales of Ba Sing Se. In the episode, we see Iroh shopping around the city, and he helps people and offers advice throughout the segment. Now, when I first saw this episode, I thought he was just gonna go have himself a little picnic. And then all of a sudden... Wait. What's he doing? Oh. Oh no. And then he says... If only I could have helped you. Jeez, that's deep. What follows is probably the saddest moment in the entire series. The cheerful old man we grew to love in book one suddenly became a character that was filled with indefinite sadness and regret. But the greatness in Iroh's character is that he didn't let that ruin his life. And he believes he has a second chance with his nephew, Zuko. One of Iroh's greatest moments is when he gets upset with Zuko and talks to him about choosing his own destiny. Iroh's words get through to Zuko, and Zuko ends up freeing Appa. And that's the thing about this entire season. Iroh is slowly building up Zuko to make his own decisions and to create his own destiny. Iroh realizes the error of his past as a war general for the Fire Nation and doesn't want to see his nephew follow the same path of destruction. It looks like Zuko is finally ready to create a new future for himself when Azula offers him his honor back if he helps her capture the Avatar. Sadly, Zuko betrays Iroh and Iroh gets captured. The ending for Iroh in book two is a sad one, much like his arc. Though Iroh is a supporting character in this story, his arc is one of the more memorable ones, and from a writing perspective, it's a great example of storytelling. After Admiral Zhao went scuba diving at the end of book one, Fire Lord Ozai sends his daughter Azula to hunt down Zuko and Iroh. Now there's a lot to be said about Azula, because even though she and Zuko came from the same household, it's obvious that they were treated differently as kids. We learn in book one when Zuko tells this to an unconscious Aang. You're like my sister. Everything always came easy to her. She's a firebending prodigy, and everyone adores her. My father says she was born lucky, 
He says I was lucky to be born. Not only is Azula the favorite, but she has the ability to bend blue fire and lightning. Azula is also used to getting things her way. One of the times this sticks out is when she basically forces one of her childhood friends, Tai Li, to join her team, deciding to make the circus performer's life impossible. Azula then recruits Mei, and together, the three continue to hunt Zuko and Iroh, along with Avatar Aang. This results in some of the most intense fight scenes in Book 2, as all three of these ladies are talented warriors. Throughout the series, Azula and her forces run into their target several times, but perhaps one of the best encounters to feature her character in general is in the episode The Chase. After pursuing the Avatar, Azula finds herself in a three-way showdown with Aang and Zuko. It's a fantastic fight that really shows how broken her abilities are. I mean, look at this! She chops up a building using fire! Eventually, everyone joins forces and Azula gets cornered. It's a great scene that really shows just how ruthless she is. In an effort to escape, she fires lightning at Iroh, badly hurting him. She escapes in the chaos, and this says a lot about her character. I mean, she almost killed her own family member. Even though she grew up with Iroh as a child, she has no remorse and can only see him as the enemy. This is also shown when she almost kills her own brother in the beginning of the season. Later on, one of her missions is to take over Ba Sing Se using a drill, but Team Avatar stops her. This leads her and her team to infiltrate Ba Sing Se disguised as the Kyoshi Warriors. Her abilities of leadership and intimidation are best shown as she takes over the Dai Li and ends up conquering Ba Sing Se from the inside out. She's a master of manipulation and knows how to shake people to get her way. Azula even manages to manipulate Zuko to portray Iroh so that their uncle doesn't get in the way of capturing the Avatar. And when the fight finally starts to reach its climax, Azula straight up zaps Aang. Like, if you take a second to think about it, Azula actually completed most of her missions by the end of Book 2. Iroh is captured, Ba Sing Se is conquered, and the Avatar is out of the picture. Azula wins big time, but there's definitely something twisted about her character. She's written out to be an amazing villain, but we'll have to wait until Book 3 to see what becomes of her and her team. Alright, so straight up. Book 2 of Avatar is a fantastic continuation of Book 1. It adds additional characters and focuses on the development of many of them. At no point does the story ever feel clunky because of them either. I actually can't think of anything negative to say about Book 2. Even episodes that you'd think might be filler actually add greatly to the development of characters, especially Tales of Ba Sing Se. In conclusion, Avatar Book 2 is an amazing second season to an animated series. It adds a ton of new elements to what was already a great show and makes it even better by subverting expectations. I give Avatar The Last Airbender Book 2 an A+. It continued developing characters after the first season and has a dramatic finish with tons of unanswered questions that can only be resolved in Book 3. And I can't wait to review the final season! Oh, and before I forget, I was wondering, who's your favorite character from Avatar and why? Mine is Katara because of all the versatility she has with her bending and how she's always trying to keep the team together. So what did you think about Avatar The Last Airbender's second season? Or about this review? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and click on that bell to get more notifications in the future. Also, be sure to check out some of our other reviews. Thanks for watching, and catch you later.